So, <laughs> one of the things I pulled out of Juliana's talk is that, and indeed was highlighted by several of our flash speakers, was that science is a human activity. And we should be relating that back to the people who are doing the science. You know, can you name an Asian scientist? So how do we turn scientists, not into celebrities, but people who become household names? And I'd like to ask all our panel people that question. Shall we start with you, Juliana? Sure, thank you. <laughs> I guess that's my raison d'etre. The reason that I'm here is, uh, I think about this question every day. How do I make Asian scientists household names? The same way a celebrity is or a politician is. I bet you er anyone can un tell you the name of a politician or a, a local politician or a local celebrity. So I applied for a grant um, two years ago, which was coincided with the 50th birthday of Singapore. We call it SG50. So we published a book called Singapore's Scientific Pioneers. And uh, we had 25 uh, scientists in the book, which we, we interviewed, we photographed beautifully, and wrote editorial stories on. We launched it, and the book Singapore's Scientific Pioneers, the PDF version, can be downloaded from free, for free on the internet. If you go look for it, I'm happy to provide a link as well. I think that was my way of saying, let's honor the scientists where I am from, let's write their stories. And um, some of these scientists had already retired, so we were interviewing them at home. You know, um, They had lost touch, but they were so pleased that we had recognized their work. And we invited them to a beautiful launch party at a hotel, and we treated them like celebrities for a day. Um, so I think we need to find these pioneering scientists and, and highlight their work. That's, I guess, my, my short answer to that. Thank you. Um, I can <clears throat> like to respond by including some things that each of our speakers brought up, which is um, we can't possibly present somebody as a household word or as somebody that should be admired unless there is trust between scientists and the public. Um, I think from the, my own country, if you went and asked um, if scientists were responsible for their well-being, you would get uh, statistics that were probably more um, alarming. There, I don't believe that. I think in my country, um, people believe that politicians actually make their lives better than actually science does. And so that's an educational problem. And so I think, uh, at least in some areas, an educational campaign is necessary as part of the communication. Uh, connecting putting a face to the science, connecting the science that leads to improvements for our lives um, to actual individuals. Um, it's in you know science communicators' hands, I think, to start creating the story, the, the connection, so that people now look to scientists um, again, much like they did. You know, my understanding is after, there have been many studies that have done, that after World War II, uh, the public, because of all the incredible advances that came, some good, some bad, uh, during that, that war, that people were looking to uh, scientists to make their lives better, curing cancer, um, you know, modernizing their homes so nobody had to do anything but press a button and, and things would happen. Happen. And that the science community um, was elevated to a point that they could never uh, accomplish what was promised. And as a result, it, again, in my country where much of this work has been and looked at, there was a lack of trust between scientists and the public because they didn't deliver. And so, again, I think we need to establish that again through education. So um, this question is difficult for me to answer uh, because I'm also one of the uh, uh, researchers. But uh, I would say the one of the important thing is to make the uh, public uh, more and more interested in science and technology. And uh, as I mentioned, the understanding of the uh, details uh, always very important. But details usually need the uh, uh, background information. So, but if the public 
is getting more and more interested in science and technology. So they should naturally find more interesting in individual researchers, and then some people maybe uh, recognize uh, better than before. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Let me try it again. I'm going to turn this open to the hall and see what questions we have for our speakers. Who would like to start? At the back. Thank you. Uh, hi, my name is uh, Dr. Rachel Harding. I'm at the University of Toronto. I just want to thank you all for amazing talks this morning. Um, I had a question to touch back on what was mentioned to do with trust between the public and scientists. And I think, you know, there is this problem, particularly in the West, of distrust of scientists as they are seen as these elitist, perhaps left-wing hacks who are very disconnected from the general public. And um, I really like Juliana's talk with, uh, you know, she had these call to action points. I was just wondering if any of you had suggestions for what someone like myself or as a scientist or science communicators in the room could do as action points to try and build the trust back between us and the general public. Well, well, one thing I think, and I'm very guilty of this myself, is I underestimate um, the, uh, cap the capacity of the public to understand the science and the capacity of the public to actually make connections between uh, the work that we do and how it impacts their lives. And so I think, we, as scientists, we need to respect the people that we're talking to. We need to uh, c make an effort to connect to them in a way that they will understand. That's part of the reason my talk was about how do you make connections between people who aren't scientists, which most people aren't, and maybe uh, had science in high school, but um, you know have forgotten much of it, um, and, and in most cases only saw it as a topic to learn so that you could test well. And so um, I, I think that's, that's a start, is realizing who you're talking to. Um, I have a quick point to add on, on that note, which is um, maybe this is where science communicators can help. I think if we do not uh, exaggerate the science that was being produced in the lab, we could actually have better trust. Because when I was a scientist, um, I, I work on drug delivery, so this is a field that is particularly prone to exaggeration in the media. We would do a study in a petri dish in vitro, and a report will come out that says uh, we found a cure for uh, late stage cardiovascular disease, which is not true. And we would have emails. I have received long emails from people whose family have late stage severe atherosclerosis, and they said they are thankful that we found a cure for it which we did not. So we have to write back saying, sorry, these were done in, you know, in animal studies and in vitro. Uh, it may take five to 10 years. So I think science communicators can try to be more accurate and less suggestive with their, with their facts. If it was done in, a, in vitro, just say, um, a small molecule shows promise for prostate cancer in the lab. Even though it, it has results in fewer clicks, fewer readers, um, it will in the long term help the scientists uh, seem uh, be more accurate with where they are in their research. Thank you. So uh, your question is very important in the trust relationship. Uh, to establish the trust relationship, I believe the accuracy and uh, honest uh, may be very important. However, frequently when I interact with news people, the journalist ask me the almost identical question repeatedly, and then in the end, when I said the uh, somewhat ambitious statement, so that will be quoted. <laughs> so uh, I would say uh, we should carefully, you know, uh, make this speech uh, precisely what we have done, and that could be considered as a future work. So such kind of accurate and honest statement can establish the good relationship uh, between uh, scientists and uh, publics. Indeed, when I look at the, uh, uh, our experiences of the event of March 11th, the many people said, at least in Japan, the nuclear power station is 100% safe. So that is not accurate. So, so such kind of basic uh, understanding and accurate uh, communication will be the most critically important so to establish a good relationship. Actually, 
I'd just like to add one little thing to that, and that is that uh, you know, working in astrobiology, uh, it's been all, uh, and, and my original training being as a microbial ecologist, one of my biggest challenges go coming to NASA was to change the public's perspective about what they should be excited about if we find life. Everyone wanted something with a face that could wave at them, that was recognizable as a humanoid, and, and what we're likely to find initially, perhaps, is going to be microbial. And so we, we developed messaging to help the public understand why microbes are so important and why microbes might be something we actually found. Again, they still wish the microbes had faces and could talk to them, but it was a, 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 an actual campaign and it required a lot more effort to make it, you still have to make news interesting. Uh, and that still is your job as science communicators. Without exaggerating, make the news interesting. Thank you very much. Next question. Yes. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for your uh, talk. It's v uh, very enlightening. Uh, well, my question is regarding the types of science you can communicate. Uh, it, in a sense, it's somewhat easier to to get clicks or to convince the public the value of science if you're doing something phenomenal, you know, uh, curing cancer, uh, medical stuff. But then the importance of basic research, you know, gets sidelined, unfortunately. And, you know, it, to the best of our efforts, trying to communicate the importance of basic research, trying to say, okay, yeah, this research right now might be, you know, is might not connect to curing a disease. It, it's like the value of doing science in itself, I, I believe, is important. And being able to communicate is that, I think, is difficult. Could you comment on, say, like, what kind of strategies could be implemented to just improve the general audience's appreciation for basic research or the fundamental science, science for the science? sake. So how do we get the audience excited when you're not curing cancer? Well, to excuse myself, uh, I'm an engineer, not a scientist. <laughs> And then uh, engineer uh, have to contribute the uh, people's life better. And then uh, I'm always thinking like that. So uh, if the space is limited, so there is a competition between engineer and science. So what kind of news can be covered by well limited space of newspaper? But um, well, sorry, I, I have no idea to answering your question. <laughs> but of course, to understand the basics of engineering aspect, so science and fundamentals are always very important. And I'm hoping that public gets the better understanding and uh, makes much more interested in such kind of basics. But um, maybe other two experts uh, can give you a better answer. Uh I'll try my best. So I began as a basic scientist. My, all my degrees are in biology, but I started to work on drug delivery. So I became an engineer, a biomedical engineer. So I could probably try my, to answer. This is my, my thought, and I could be wrong. I think people go on the internet to find information in a self-seeking way. They go online to find information for themselves, for their family, for their kids. How do I fix my car? Or my phone is wet, how do I fix it? They don't go online to say, you know, what is the breakthroughs in biology? They're not, they, they have self-seeking behavior. So they are more interested, therefore, in a, you know, a new invention. Like just this week, uh, a paper from Singapore, a robot, can use AI to build IKEA furniture. So that got lots of views. They're not going to be interested in the molecular pathway. This protein phosphorylates that protein, that phosphorylates that protein. So unfortunately, uh, as a commercial magazine that tracks all kinds of views, I can tell you the basic stuff ain't going to get as many views as the applied stuff, especially the cool applied stuff. But on that note, when it comes to anything to do with space and astronomy, like some basic uh, quantum physics, we, we tend to get lots of hits for some reason. So when it goes to as basic as that, yes, then it gets really exciting again. Yeah. 
like something to do with quarks or something. Yeah. Gravitational waves, some, you know, if, if it's something that fundamental, they, it seems to explode on the internet. Thanks. But do you think that, you know, I, I was thinking about the gravitational waves, which most people don't understand, but know that that's something really exciting, and they should be really exciting that we found it, or a new subatomic particle, they should be excited that we found, you know, uh, uh, and not just because of the Big Bang Theory, finding the boson-Higgs particle, you know, and so I, I'm wondering if, if there can't be excitement around things that are fundamental that you know you you cast it and i don't know i don't know the answer either uh but you cast it as a question that uh and the story is the question has plagued scientists and engineers for millennia or it was the first time it was an, uh, asked was 300 years ago or you know what you know so make a story about it so that even if they don't understand the actual detail they understand the importance of the discovery I have a point to make on the Higgs boson. I think the Higgs boson benefited from having a nickname, the God, <laughs> the God particle, and it was used extensively across all the media. My editors were, you know, not so comfortable with the word the God particle, but we still have, you know, had to insert it somewhere because that's what people wanted to seek. Um, so it does help if you make it, you 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 personify it, you create a you know a name for it. Now. I bring that up because in nanotechnology or nanoparticles, every nanoparticle that we design is different by like a, one or two features. So if you have its name, nobody's going to really appreciate it for what is too long, all the different parts of it. So people like to give it nicknames. So we call it like um, nano razors, nano diamonds. Uh, I have some nano burrs, you know, like they're sticky and. We have nano everything on, on, you can imagine, and that helps. So giving it an accessible name like the God particle, a nano diamond, really changes uh, the game. Nano diamonds is a real thing. You can Google it if you wish. Yeah. Thank you. More questions? Yes. Uh, actually, I have a comment about uh, this last question. Um, I, I am doing fundamental physics, and uh, what I do is really not interesting to the, <laughs> to the general public. And uh, I have been thinking, I have a lot of friends who ask me, and I have been thinking about this for a long time. And uh, my theory is it's about human survival. So we need to uh, have understand our environment as much as possible. So the more information we have, and the more uh, we can survive in this uh, environment. So this is uh, my theory about uh, why we do fundamental physics, because everyone cannot continue learning about um, the, the environment, but we scientists can continue, and maybe it's a, it will lead to nothing, but uh, the more we know and the more we can uh, adapt to the environment and the more we can uh, survive in the environment. So this is my theory about that. Uh, out of curiosity, what is your field? Uh, nuclear astrophysics. Nuclear astrophysics. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, I'm quite tempted to issue a challenge to the floor for someone to tell me how do we make nuclear astrophysics <laughs> really, really catchy. So I open it up to questions or you can answer that one. <laughs> I think it sounds cool. <laughs> I think it sounds hot. <laughs> True. So, um, hi, uh, Mo Atwa, uh, OIST PhD student. Uh, literally the polar, polar opposite of what you did. Uh, started in engineering, uh, materials engineering and am now working as an experimental physicist. And my concern is, or like my question to you all is, how do we address the depiction of the scientist in modern media? Because you watch movies, and the scientist drinks a couple of mugs of coffee and sits on it for one evening, and there you go, we have a new element. Or 
we've cured cancer, or that's how we're going to get the asteroid out of Earth's gravitational field. And that's, again, it ties into what Mary was saying of like, people are promising society the moon on our behalf. And it's really hard to fill those shoes. So how do we address that? How do we address that depiction? So the, the, the summary would be, how do we counter the media's portrayal of scientists where they tend to make great discoveries on one cup of coffee and an overnight snap? <laughs> well, that's certainly a challenge. I said, people don't like things that are boring. And if you were to watch me do my research, <laughs> And you had to wait the months. That would not make a very interesting film. Um, I, I, I appreciate uh, the comment that you made. I remember, do people know the, the TV show CSI? Well, I was very excited initially about this program. It's a uh, crime scene investigation, and it's about all these modern molecular techniques, which I used for my research, um, applied to solving crimes. And uh, I remember, you know, oh, this is great. People will actually know what, you know, sequencing is and how you can use DNA as a fingerprint. And, and then I got super frustrated, or at least I wanted their technicians that could get results overnight again. <laughs> you know, you'd see them pipette into a little tube, and the next thing you know, we knew who the killer was. Um, uh, yeah, so I, I actually don't have an answer except to, to say that I... I think that, again, we may have underestimated our audiences. Maybe they are willing to look a little bit more at things that are boring if you maybe inject humor. I, I love the show Bing ba Big Bang Theory. I know some of my colleagues think it's insulting to them as a scientist that they, they're teasing and making fun of us and, and you know, purposefully making... Um, uh, you know Leonard or or uh, or one of, yeah Sheldon actually make some ridiculous uh, snotty comment, but I actually think I feel more appreciated as a scientist because of that TV show. You know, in fact, they're sort of expecting me to be geeky and nerdy and say things. So maybe it's uh, hoping helping the media portray us a little bit more as human. Um, and not as, we don't need to be superheroes. I don't think we need to be the one that comes in and solves everything, because then you are uh, setting up an expectation that's impossible for us to, to fulfill. I actually have a, a, a point to make on that, uh, a, a, a different perspective. I'm not sure if that's a bad thing to, you know, to make us look cool. I have to give you this example, and it's a medical example. So my husband is a doctor, you know, he, he's, he does not like the program House. Have any of you watched that? He absolutely detests the show House, because he said everything that he, the doctor does, Dr. House does, is wrong, it's not accurate. We will be watching the program on the couch, and he'll be like, what? That's wrong. That's absolutely not correct. That's totally wrong. And then I would be on the other side saying, that's an awesome show. I love House. <laughs> so what may look bad to us may encourage a, a young person to, uh, to, to be a scientist. So maybe if we look a little cooler than we really are, it may not be a bad thing. The, the point isn't not to look cool. I think that we should be, look as cool as possible. Stereotype. I mean, exactly, the stereotyping right. of scientists or doctors or other, again, like this kind of like what I call uh, like ivory tower syndrome. It kind of, it dehumanizes us. It makes us into these like almost demi-human figures that are capable of all of these things. And that is the expectation that people now have as a society of us being able to do. And then we don't because we can't because that's not how it actually is. And then they're just like, oh, you're all full of bullshit. You don't know how to actually do these things. You promise us so much, but give us so, so little. I think people can separate fact from fiction. I mean, when we watch like a fighter pilot saving Earth from an alien, we, we know it's, it's TV. We know it's a movie. I, I do... I do think that we are not a movie from Hollywood does not promise accuracy. I think people are smarter enough than that. 
yes, there are some stereotypes that we could challenge. For example, the one that I'm challenging is that a scientist is a Caucasian. You know, I, I'm challenging that. Or actually a good scientist or a famous scientist. I'm also, as a female scientist, I also want to challenge the idea that a scientist is male. So um, yes, there are many stereotypes. We can't get rid of all of them. We are, I'm guilty as charged of some. So uh, there is no easy answer. Thank you. So uh, at the University of Tokyo, of course, there's been very futuristic technology. You just gave an excellent presentation on some of it. Has that ever led, in your experience, to unrealistic expectations from the public? Well, the, of course, public response is always uh, unpredictable. And uh, <laughs> when I show the, uh, uh, our movie that was featured by many news, uh, get the many news coverage, my impression is 70% looks positive, but 30% and uh, you shouldn't spend the tax money to make this kind of funny development. But in any cases, so if they respond, that may show some interest and that makes me happy. So important thing is to attract the people's attention. Uh, hopefully positive feedback is favorable, but the important thing, you know, so attracting much attention. If any publicity is good publicity. <laughs> How about a question from the right side of the room? I've been ignoring you guys. <laughs> Thanks. Um, my name is Peter Karajanis. I'm from Kyoto University. Uh, I guess kind of following that point, um, I was interested in, in the, the talks by the two women in that you were commenting on the audience. So the influence, Mary commented on about the influence of the program the NOA had on students. And then Juliana mentioned about the influence of religion. Um, and I was curious, in all this communication we talk about, we discuss the science, we don't discuss the narrative of the person. And I'm wondering if empathy is something that's absent. So as an example to Muhammad's comment about it's in TV, it's done like that, a lot of people don't know, ignoring the science behind the discovery, they don't know that that one discovery is three to five years of research. It's a lot of failure. It's a lot of self-doubt. Um, and. As a communicator, I've always really enjoyed hearing more about the people. And I'm wondering if in your experiences, is that something that needs to be done more? How do you do that? Can you incorporate that more effectively than just focusing on the science, but focusing on the people? Because in the end, Mary remarked on Stuart, you want your audience to be stewards. And they're more likely to be stewards when they're not advocating, if you want to use politics as an example, you're, 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 you're enamored by the person less than the policy. And so I think science can do the same. So just to summarize, the struggle is real, and we should be portraying that perhaps more rather than just the final outcome of the research. I think there was a really good uh, point. I actually have an answer for that. Um, I am actually more interested in the scientists and their narrative and their history and all their failures than the final result. I think you're right to say that there's more story there than the result. Uh, in fact, one Japanese scientist who has that, all of that is Kosuke Morita. His work is truly a, a battle, an uphill battle. He first uh, found evidence of 113 element, but he spent nine years proving it. And then later he had to battle with um, another team overseas for, the, for who, who was first to discover it. So the nine year battle uh, in my interview with him uh, I felt was more interesting than him, uh, than the, the final result, which is that he discovered it. So yes, if we could only highlight the, the struggles and the journey, I think it would be a more compelling narrative overall. Um, give a very famous example of where people focused on the personality. Everybody in the room here knows what PCR is, right? the polymerase chain reaction was invented by an individual named Carrie Mullins. And there was a piece either, I think it was in Nature, it might have been in Science, but it was a high profile journal that basically documented, um, I, I think that, I believe this, the journalist went on a car ride him, uh, with him from Southern California up into, uh, into the Sierras or something and documented all that he had gone through, both including things about 
damages to his personal life and as he was moving forward with this discovery. And I, that was, a, I think, a pretty profound and influential um, piece on uh, a scientist, them as their, you know, highlighting their struggle, highlighting who they are as people and, and making them human. Um, and, you know, I, I remember more details about that piece than other science articles I've written myself. <laughs> so. Any, any comments? <laughs> Just uh, quickly, so the behind the big uh, success of discovery of invention, so there exists always the uh, competition. Uh, and uh, well, scientists are not usually speak, uh, doesn't usually speak out such kind of competition uh, because that's always ongoing. And uh, some statement may upset the uh, competing research group, so and then that makes the situation more difficult. But well, if journalists can make the good story uh, behind that uh, uh, kind of invention, makes the uh, good uh, public attention. So. Well, we're now out of time and we're going to break for lunch, but I'm sure you can corner our speakers in the afternoon. Uh, could you please join me in thanking them once again for three excellent talks?